Wrecker. Nick, my brother, how are you doing? Oh my God, I said my brother. You say my brother. And my I always... brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, so we have a fun. Uh, we've actually prepared today, which is we did. is yes. uh, new. Unusual. But before we get, <laughs> yeah. It's unusual. Uh, before we get to our uh, our uh, actual content today, let's talk about an email we received from we did my my uh, mentor and. Uh, I, can I call him my friend? I don't know. I admire him so much. It's hard, but I, I love Kali and he occasionally sends us notes. Kali Luton and sends us notes telling us what we got wrong, yeah, uh, which is good. And yeah, which is very good, which is good. I actually said like, we, we don't usually get, we do get feedback. We don't get a lot of, uh, you know, feedback on our content. We do yeah. have people complaining about my language and stuff and, and yeah. you know, whatever, but uh, he did write uh, about things we got wrong or, you know, like, and anyway, he criticized us. And I just want to say, in the spirit of science, I think that's good, isn't it? It's good. Yeah, absolutely. So, and it's, I think most of it was focused on that episode with Kathy Orquart, where she was talking about the journalists and she talked about how AIS came up with uh, the journalist. And I, of course, being the man of the people and whatever else, I, I was I was arguing against what I saw as the elitism of the AIS and the AIS list and so on and so forth. And, you know, he... He kind of, at least my impression is that Kali thought, you know, we were bashing uh, AIS and doing so unfairly. And he's probably right, right? And, and here right, the yeah. AIS is a bunch of people who, uh, I guess I, it was founded, and maybe we should get someone from AIS on to talk about its founding if we think that's interesting. But, uh, you know, Bob Gallier, some others created the organization to make the information system field strong, stronger, right? And to give it legitimacy. Yeah. And these are volunteers. They're leaders in our field. You and I benefit from the fact that they worked above and beyond their, their uh, uh, requirements of their professor jobs, wherever they were. They were doing fine. They, they did a lot to build the field. And I think me in my little snot-nosed way of, of kind of you know, being anti-elitist, I didn't appreciate the the good work and the volunteer work a lot of people over the years have done with AIS. So I totally stand corrected there. Um, I think what's interesting is you see all that and then you put yourself in my shoes now and I look at it as kind of a non-transparent elitist group. Yeah. But that's, you know, I can also see the other side, which is, well, but these are a bunch of folks who really uh, did a lot to create the field that I'm benefiting from dramatic yeah right I, I think so too i mean like these are clearly partisans and in a way we, we at some stage we talked about romanticism right that we love the field and so forth and i think you know we stand on on some gigantic shoulders that not only love the field but really did a lot of good things to do this and i don't think we meant to say that we we disrespect what they've done i i do still think that some of our criticisms are fair to be honest about yeah. transparency and sort of sort of uh but you know i i have the utmost respect for everything that these people have done and continue to do um and i felt a little bit bad about not only ais we also bashed the senior scholars and i some at some stage fa feel that i need to jump into their defense yeah, as you know i'm i'm also one of them it's 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 not actually by choice you know you get get sort of i don't know you become part of that right uh, all of yeah. a sudden, you're a senior scholar, um, and they do good things. And I kept yeah. saying that a few times. Maybe I should say this again. They do key, do good things, and no, they're not an official government item. My criticism there is that they should be. Same as the other hmm. college. They should be part of the governance portal. I find it bad that they're not. Anyway, um, so they these people are doing a lot of uh, great things. And I, yeah, probably fairly enough, we've been criticized that they don't necessarily do this for elitist reasons. It does come no. across as elitist. A little paternalistic, a yeah, little... Yeah, and you can't uh, think so it about comes the across, naming. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, all of that is good intention. By the way, it, it, that still stands with my, my viewpoint that the list that they've created, I think it had a purpose at... And it did a very good job, and the job's done. You know, yeah, that's my point. My, my my point is legitimization, professionalization, all the wonderful things and the side effects. And yes, it did a lot of good, especially for folks in my regions. You know, region two, region three, they clearly benefited from that list. Yeah, uh, I don't. I just think it's no longer needed. That's it, right? And 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 yeah. by the way, also still. I don't think making that list too long is a good idea at all. Sorry. I, yeah. I just don't think so. Yeah. So I think we, we agree on that. And the other thing, and you and I proposed an ISIS uh, conference once, and and my experience there was really bad with AIS. I thought it was not transparent. I thought it was poorly run. 
I thought uh, I had a lot of issues with that. That uh, so my experience with AIS is is not transparent. I think is the number one problem, and uh, and I think it's uh, so. So I have issues, but at the same time, I do appreciate everything everyone's done before and as volunteers. And then I always pick on the senior scholars slam as like a yeah. a. Uh, uh, you call it the worst thing you've ever seen in your it life. It feeds this this celebrity culture that we, I don't know, but Kali actually pointed out that that's, although it's called the Senior Scholars Slam or whatever, it's not something the Senior Scholars does. Apparently, uh, it's something that's just done. Uh, I guess Claudia Lebec, who's, uh, I don't know her very well, but she's a very nice person. Uh, she was also she, the AI's president. She runs it. Uh, yeah. Yep, for, at some stage. So she runs it. So he it. corrected us there. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, we stand corrected to some extent by Kali. Now we should move on, right? Exactly, exactly. But in, in principle, of course, he's right. Like when we when we when you start criticizing things, you should do something about it. I think that's yeah. fair enough. And in a way, I think you. I don't. I don't think we intended to be this way. But this podcast is doing a little bit and talking about these issues and, and and creating a little bit of transparency. Maybe transparency is lacking. Yeah. And of course, we don't have the the insight or the wisdom. But I do think that every now and then, people we look at things like just some some other people would do as well. Like so, some of that that history. Why isn't this written up somewhere? You know, why we we don't know about yeah. it. Even you and I don't know about all of this stuff. And maybe it should. And and I thought the idea of getting someone from the AIS, maybe a story and other president, the current president. Let's bring him on, whoever it is, whoever is listening to us. Let's do an episode on the AIS. Why not? It's it's, it's sure. a good idea. All right. So with that said, another thing Kale uh, yelled at me about, uh, this was a couple of months ago, we did a philosophy podcast. <laughs> and there I made some disparaging remarks about uh, old school philosophy. And I think I said something to the effect of, you know, we're lame philosophers. I don't know what, come on, I'm on a podcast. I'm riffing as I go. Anyway, one of the things that I thought we could do, and, and he corrected me saying, look, there's this wonderful stuff that was done to create philosophical foundations in a lot of areas. And and then uh, he thought we were unfair there. Uh, so I thought, or, or we were discussing as we were WhatsApping each other, hey, why don't we look at some of that old stuff and think about what is still current? Like if it's a new professor, a uh, new PhD student right now, what can we tell them that they should be familiar with, say, before the year 2000, that is still applicable today, right? What are some old theories that are relevant, not old theories that are irrelevant. Like you're not allowed to say TAM. TAM, as far as I'm concerned, is no longer relevant. You cannot include <laughs> wow. that in your list record. So I'm, I'm crossing TAM off my list right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> but but the, to be honest, folks, I looked at this quite differently, right? So I, I, I didn't think of the... We, Nick and I, we both created a list, and we'll get to that in a second. But I didn't create it from the viewpoint of whether or not that's still relevant today. I just figured these are five things that were really dominant before the year 2000, you know, and people should know about them, whether or not they decide to work with it now or not is a different question. But I have a view of like, it would be, it, it's sometimes good to know where you're coming from to see where you're going. And then it explain. I do think it explained these sort of ideas, they explain a lot what we see in the journals and what got published. And in, 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 in consequence, also, you know, got on the board and who makes decision now and it explains really how the field is moving by looking at what has been done and what was evoked, what was in focus, and why was it hip, and you know, and maybe also why was why isn't it hip anymore? So that's that's how I looked at it, what we're doing today. Sorry. All right. So with that said, you're not going to mention Tam, are you? I'm not going to mention Tam. I had a few candidates okay. that I decidedly not to. So, Fox, what we're doing today, we give you the big five, the big five theoretical, oh, I guess what ideas or perspectives or streams of thinking before the year 2000. <laughs> and we're going to count down backwards, aren't we? Well, I don't know. When you say big five, dude, you and I clearly don't <laughs> communicate well. Because no. that's not what, but all right, we're going to give you your big five. We're going to count backwards. And then I'll tell you what I wanted. I want to see what yours are. I have no idea okay. what yours are. So start yeah, with number five. What is it? So I'll, I'll start with number five. And, and also I, I picked one where I thought you wouldn't pick them. Okay. Okay. Because I kind of think I know what your interests are. Maybe not, but I'll, I'll pick some different ones. So here's my number, my fifth place on my grand big theories of the 90s list. And it's uh, a Rogers diffusion of innovation. Um, you know, that that the S-curve model of early adopters, late adopters, and of course, uh, this, this variance model of that theory with um, all the uh, attributes that characterize an innovation as likely being successful, being adopted, and so forth. So we're talking... Perceived compatibility, complexities of use, a relative advantage in these sorts of things. 
Now, yeah. that's a theory, I think, from the 60s or something, but that really did a lot, was the basis for a lot of research, of, of course, in technology adoption uh, in the 80s and 90s. And the one paper that really, that really left a big mark for many reasons is Moore's and Bebesat's 1991 ISR paper, the one mm -hmm. uh, measuring the... Uh, measuring the perceived attributes of uh, technological innovations, they basically build mm -hmm. the scale for that theory. And that, yeah. you know, got used tens of thousands of times. So I think that had a massive impact of research in the, uh, you know, especially in the 90s, not so much in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s even. No, I think it does today. So so a couple of things R Rogers did. So first off, if you go read, go look at the book itself, when he's talking about diffusion of innovation, a couple of the innovations I remember from the book, one is boiling water. So he's not talking about technology here, No, he's right? not at all. Absolutely not. No. Uh, and he's talking about poor countries, how they're just using water in the stream. And that if you would take that and just boil the water in the stream, people would be a lot healthier and they wouldn't get as sick and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that the theory comes is, from the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is you couldn't get them to just boil their water, right? So he looked at, you know, influential individuals, like central nodes. and So what it did was it really opened up. That was the theoretical foundation for early network theory and ideas of centrality and centrality of diffusion wow. across a network. So you could almost trace network theory's roots back to Rogers. Uh, the the other thing is a lot of institutional theory has uh, has uh, taken that as a founder. The other thing was seed, right? They were looking at farmers using different types of seeds in their farms. And, you know, so it wasn't like IT type of technology that Rogers was dealing with. But then when you, and then if you look at contemporarily nowadays, of course, there's diffusion of innovation across a network. I think we see a lot of that, but we also see a lot of discur discursive stuff like uh, Shayla Miranda's work. Uh, Michael Barrett Locked has it. a paper. We can put it in our notes. Uh, Liz Davidson. There's a lot of this stuff of how technology and like the organizing visions work, right? The yeah. stuff around organizing visions. A lot of it gets their root in that diffusion of innovation Uh it, it, it is. But, you know, the, the other thing that I want to say, we, we look at these things very differently because when I think of this his model and what it spurred, and I mentioned the Moore and Bambasad paper then, you know, they, a lot of that didn't really look at the diffusion process at all and the S-curve and, the, you know, the network mm -hmm. spread and all these sort of things. What did they look at? They looked at determinants and the variance model with a dependent variable that was then intention to use, you know, adoption, uh, success, uh, uh, these sorts of things. Yeah. And I, again, would say like, uh, this is why did they do it? Because this is where they could get data on. That was possible to do. Now we can do all sorts of things. Now we can look mm -hmm. at discourse analysis, you know, over Reddit communities over a time span of 10 years or whatever. In the 90s, that wasn't possible. What was possible is to give people that were either forced, early, late, mandatory, voluntary adopters of technology in the firm, you know, basically give them a survey document, literally a page, and say like, hi, I just gave you Oracle. Please fill out these questions about technical complexity, ease of use, and perceived need. And, you know, some of the other stuff, like social norms and, and, and these sorts yeah. of things. And that's and really how gonna... that accumulated tradition yeah. really built up. They took this model and added bubbles on the left, on the right, you know, moderated yeah, so you seem to You seem yeah. to take a variance kind of perspective of, yeah. and I and I, you're right, I, I definitely am more into the process Uh uh, streams that came from it. Now, with that said, the one process paper I would say pre two thousands that takes from a diffusion of innovation standpoint is Swanson and Rao Miller's nineteen ninety five organizing vision. Yeah. vision one. So, I would say if you're more into the process side rather than the var if it's the variant side, maybe the Ben Bissett, and if it's the process, maybe Swanson and Rao Miller would be a fun uh, place to think Very about good. how it's constructed. Right. And it's what, what about your number five on the list? How, what do you like about my number five? Do you like it? It was I bad. loved it. Yeah, and yeah, it's not on my good. list, so it's perfect. I think we fit. Uh, so I can I don't have ordering, but I'll just throw one out that I think is really relevant now. And again, it's not it didn't start in our field, but I think um, if you're doing work on things like uh, algorithmic aversion and and all of these things that are hot right now, what do you need a foundation in? I think you need a foundation in Kahneman and Tversky. Right. So behavioral oh, economics. Okay. Right. You need uh, Kahneman and Tversky. They're the, they're, I guess they did their work in the 60s and 70s, the really famous work. They did a yeah. bunch of fun little experiments. And what they were basically arguing against, they're economists and they were, or I guess psychologist economists. They won Nobel Prizes and they were arguing against purely rational ways of reasoning. And they showed how people were irrational in pretty predictable ways. They're famous for prospect theory. Right, which is kind of the relative advantage and risk aversion uh, theories. 
Uh, they had other heuristics and, and biases, like they had their uh, representation heuristic, they had confirmation bias, right? <laughs> they did all these experiments. And if you look now, a lot of people are doing work on like nudging and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Well, they find their roots directly in Kahneman and Tversky. And, you know, in the 90s, early 2000s, it was a bit fashionable to argue against Kahneman and Tversky and show they were wrong. And then and then now there's a lot of people, you know, the the two... What is it? The thinking fast and slow, Thaler, and then and then yeah. nudging. So yeah, all Taylor of these in there. Yeah, yeah. They find, yeah, they they find a way back. It's kind of hot again. Uh, oh, it's totally hot. Yeah, it's it's totally at the. Um, oh, I forgot my point. I wanted to say something. Yeah, but kind of minutes away. So that would be my point. If you're doing psychological behavioral economics around algorithms, algorithmic uh, algorithm this, algorithmic that, and you're doing online experiments, you have no business doing these things unless you're well steeped in Kahneman and Tversky, right? And in behavioral that's economics. Right. So that like was it. one I of like my it. five. That's very good. I did, it wasn't on my list. That's very good. All right. I'll throw in the next one. Um, I'm trying to pick whether I take a great one or a not so great one. I'm taking a net, not so great one. The next one I'm going to give you, I'm pr pretty sure you won't like is media richness. And then they, you know, very, later very media <laughs> synchronicity. You don't like it, don't you? No, as a matter of fact, it was on my list, but I had before ah. media richness on my list. Media richness, oh. I think of as a as a tentacle of this other. So it's his mind too, but I would call this information processing theory. Yeah, of course. Right? It so comes, this so it is comes Galbraith. from Galbraith uh, information processing, but here's this organizational organization information processing theory or APT. Yeah? yeah, that's Galbraith. Yeah. yeah, and I thought, well, I thought I picked uh, media richness um, because this was. You know, again, where did it come? When did it come from? Eighties and nineties, when new media got introduced, the new media was called email. You know, all of a sudden, organizational communication, you know, information processing was happening through this new medium. And then later, people uh, uh, try to uh, you know apply it to other forms. Like it got another big boom during social media, and when we had video telephony and so, and so forth. And that's also when some of the holes started appearing in, in media richness theory. So media richness starts with Daft and Lengel, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and if you look at this guy, Daft, I think the most important Daft paper is, and I don't know the guy's first name. What is it? Uh, Richard, I think. Is it Richard? Is it Richard? Uh, but uh, he had Daft and Macintosh, 1981. was. So by the way, information processing theory was on mine. All right. Yeah, uh, so good. in a sense, we had the this overlap. But I thought Daft and Macintosh was the most important one because they talk about uh, analyzability. Yeah, and equivocality. This is the oh. first equivocality paper, and media richness theory is rooted in this idea of equivocality. And uh, then there's Daft and Wyke, Daft and Langle, and Daft and Langle came with the media richness. So, so the idea of equivocality is this: that uh, uncertainty is one thing, equivocality is another thing. Uncertainty, mm -hmm. if you get more data and you mm -hmm. analyze that data, you can reduce uncertainty, and that's what the assumption is of all. Kind of organizational that's the information processing kind of paradigm is that we want to reduce uncertainty we create these structures these structures to either absorb or reduce uncertainty the beautiful thing about the dask and daft and mcintosh paper is they said yeah but sometimes it's equivocal like you get more information it doesn't help you uh, more information actually maybe confuses you or doesn't help at all because it's contradictory information so analyzing doesn't actually help you solve problems and I think that idea of equivocality is really relevant today. Yes, uh, with this analytics and, and AI world, right? Uh, analytics AI helps you in uncertain situations, not in equivocal situations, right? And this idea of equivocality is where media richness had kind of got its roots. I have a paper last year where we still used equivocality. I have a student recently contact me from, uh, and they wanted to talk about equivocality. So I think this idea of equivocality is relevant now. Uh, in this world of analytics, <clears throat> I do think I just think that this entire stream, right? And I put synchronicity and all some of the other things as well. Information processing, I, it, that wasn't on my radar screen to be honest. But this, the, all these theories about media, I mean, that they continue to be relevant. Uh, and you can take that forward even when now when you take it to different types of media, yeah, from video, audio, whatever. But also, of course, now media where the information sender is not even human anymore, right? So you can apply yeah. to Chat GPT and all these sorts of things. Yeah, so I yeah. think it's a pretty pretty relevant theory. Still to this day, yeah. and, and voice interaction versus text, in, you know, written text yep. interaction, Zoom calls, and our interaction with Zoom, right? How are you going to compare Zoom meetings to real meetings if you don't understand things like media richness, right? So, Absolutely, right. and I also think that a lot of the <clears throat> the question that it tries to answer, they haven't really been answered yet. We don't really uh -huh. have conclusive verdict. Well, not in the sense that they really, you know, we don't have 
effective, really good solutions to all of this. Maybe we know some of this, but we still have incredibly inefficient information processing. We have incredibly horrible information processing by people, you know? So the way that we deal with media for information processing is far from, from you know, effective and efficient or good for that matter. So there's a whole yeah. lot of things that people can look so at. And, and then I'll cheat a little bit because, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to go after 2000, but I would say the one paper that I would uh, think about, all right, how, how can you look at how this matured, this media, media richness uh, direction? It's Dove Taney in 2001 as the cognitive effective model of organizational communication. And I would say that's the one that kind of argued with and extended and updated. And I don't know, that would be the one I'd touch if I were to try to talk about communication in the IS field. I'll you know. have to look at that one. I don't know that one. That's a gap. My gap. Okay. All right. Give me your next one. Your fourth. All right. Well, I'm going to give you my, can I just give you my number one one? Okay. Uh, because I think it's the most important one and it's the socio-technical <laughs> systems, right? Uh, and that's, uh, I, had, I had that on my list and I decided to cut it because I knew you had it on there. Yeah. But yeah, that's an <laughs> obvious one. Well, yeah, it is obvious, but it's sometimes underappreciated, right? So, so clearly I'm talking about the Tavistock Institute, right? It started with the Tristan Bamforth paper, uh, Emory and Trist. Trist has a nice 1981 paper where he kind of summarizes a lot of what uh, uh, is happening. In the IS field, the first socio-technical systems paper is Bostrom and Heinen yes, in 1977, yeah. which that that and uh, Enid Mumford as well and, and some others, I think Enid Mumford was more directly associated with Tavistock. They brought it into the information systems development. So all those development approaches, Scandinavian development, all that sort of thing was rooted in that socio-technical system. So that was the yeah. first issue, by the way, of MIS know, Quarter. It is. It is. In it's the second paper in the first issue. Yep. Yeah. So Bostrom and Heinen, great one. And and the thing with this socio-technical systems is, is, of course, that's the intuition behind our field. Right. We're not a technical field and we're not a social field. We are both. And if you're giving me too social an explanation, what I'll do is I'll introduce the technical. If you're giving me too technical an explanation, I'll introduce the human, you know, organizational social. And that's the beauty of our field. We are both. We understand social science. We understand the technology a little better than, than most other fields. So what did it do? It led us to sociomateriality, if you will, right? Uh, all of the early uh, kind of process, uh, structurational, institutional yeah, the uh, early structuration theory. approaches. Yeah. Barley, Barley, nineteen eighty six, yeah. right? Which, which is a structurational, institutional argument about how uh, new technology is an occasion for structuring, right? It's not deterministic. Technology doesn't do stuff like technical people think it does, but it's not all just humans doing things. It's it's uh, it's both, right? So. Yeah. So, so all of Orlikowski's stuff, I think, is rooted in that intuition. Our whole field, I think, is is so so. But so. then, and then, uh, yeah, go on. Sorry for interrupting. I think in that when we talk about uh, STS, I think we should mention uh, two more recent papers that sort of provide really easy entry points for people that are interested in. First of all, Robert Bostrom in two thousand nine, he wrote, wrote a follow up paper in JMIS on that nineteen seventy seven paper. You know, uh, uh, STS is a meta theory for information system. I think something like this it's called. And of course, there's the axis of cohesion paper by Supra, Supra Texaka, who looked at uh, you know social technical thinking as a as a root metaphor for information. System. And that's exactly how I would look at it as well. Yeah, was absolutely. the axis of cohesion. I'm not sure yeah. they use the term root metaphor, but no, uh, I, I I just call it that. Yeah. Yeah. So and there are, and I'll self uh with Susan Winter and Brian Butler and James Howison uh back in 2014, we wrote uh updating uh 21st century uh socio-technical work beyond organizational container. Our argument in that paper is that socio-technical systems mm -hmm. assumes things are happening within an organization. And what and we argued is, well, open source organizing platforms, all these things are happening outside. So how can we update that socio-technical perspective for outside of an organizational I container? have a question. You probably know this book, Walden 2. Have you read that? Walden 2? Walden 2? You mean Thoreau? Yeah. No, it's what? not Thoreau. It, I don't know Walden 2. Uh, Walden 2, it, it's, um, it's a thought experiment uh, about, a, a, about a, a society that is um, – Developed based on behavioral economics, based on lots of experiments in a place called Walden 2. 
Um, it was written in the 50s, I think. And it's sort of, it's very social technical, right? So the idea would be, wouldn't it be great if we did experiments on people, behavioral economics and use that to develop our society? Yeah, and it was so popular um, that people really, you know, built the society somewhere in this in the sticks in the woods in in the U.S. And it's sort of anyway. So I'm quite surprised yeah, by, by B. F. Skinner. Yeah, exactly by Brian Skinner, the guy, the behavioral uh, economist, the guy that yeah. uh, uh, you know Skinner's box, that guy. Yeah, interesting. So I, I wanted to ask you because to me, I think this book is very socio technical. Yeah, I've never the way read that it, he I guess. set up this society. Um, yeah, so it's based on his work. People, this is Skinner. He did a lot of. He basically founded behavioral psychology. He was a guy uh, doing studies on drug addiction and bystander attention and so forth. Um, and then he wrote this. It's a fictional novel on Walden too, which is basically the idea of, of of structuring society based on insight through behavioral psychology. And it got so popular that people actually, you know, some guys got together in the woods and built a society. And I don't think that kind of worked. But anyway, it's a it's a really interesting novel. Walden too. Here's my that'll be my present to you next time. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah, that sounds oh, yeah. cool. I, didn't I had know something about that you one. didn't read. All right, that's cool. All right, I'm gonna go right. give you one that you may or may not know, but that was really influential for me, which is this entire stream around cognitive load and cognitive fit theory. Okay. So right? who's so, that? I don't know uh, this. Uh, mm -hmm. Cognitive load uh, is by a guy called John Sweller in the seventies, and he did a research on problem solving, right? And the question of how do I present information for you so you learn better and know how to solve certain problems. And it was later used, especially in IS. It's one of the few kind of one of the native theories that that spurred from that is uh, Iris Vesey's work with Dennis Galletta on cognitive fit tables versus diagrams, and you know when I use charts and when I use Excel tables. And that later got used a lot in um, systems development, especially the one that used model model based software engineering and uh, models for systems and else in design, all of that stuff is based on cognitive load. And the idea is very simple, right? So when you when you have a problem, the problem is more or less complex. So that gives you load. And then you have instructions and information. And that can, too, introduce cognitive load. The problem is that our working memory is kind of limited. So you have to balance all these different loads. Some of the load is good. Like domain load is sort of instructions that I help you solve that problem. And some of that is just... And when you figure out how to best match task with your abilities with uh, information, then you get better task performance. That's the basic idea. Yeah. So I you, I worked with that a lot, yeah. and a lot of other people in this in this realm did, right? Cognitive, one of and, the cognitive theories. Do you, are people still, like, is it, st it's like learning, right? So yeah, I'm thinking learning, old yeah. school is that seven plus or minus two, yeah, you know, that's that, like a that's cognitive load. Yeah. That would, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, and then it, now it would probably come into learning theories. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. So one of the big applications by a guy called Richard Meyer, and he wrote a very famous book on multimedia learning. So how mm -hmm. do how do I create instructional materials, including mm -hmm. you know text, video, image, whatever? And that that in that in that theory it would be uh, some of that would be actually adding load. You know, you, too much information for me to actually absorb what the message is, what I'm supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so that's where it was used. And then, as I said, I used it a lot in all my conceptual modeling research. It's basically one of the fu fundamental theories that you need to say, look, this model is not so good. Why not? Well, because it overloads you. <laughs> and that's why your performance in this and this problem-solving task goes down. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And as you asked, is, is it still relevant today? You know what? I don't think so. Really? Uh, I haven't seen a recent uh -huh. application, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was still hot in the 2000s, I suppose. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that is used later. I don't use it anymore either. <laughs> but <laughs> I moved away from some of this individual level stuff. So maybe that's that's one of the reasons. But it was at that time was pretty big in, in the areas that I was interested in. Yeah. Well, the only other one that I would bring up uh, today is uh, knowledge. Right. And I think that uh, there's a lot and, and this isn't a, a fully like a very specific theory, but I think our, our uh, field did a lot with knowledge management and it did a lot with thinking about knowledge. And so did organizational. So I guess Stamper, like Ronald Stamper yeah, had his uh, uh, with semiotics and and uh, he's at least one of the early places. I don't think he came up with this. As a matter of fact, I don't know who came up with the data information knowledge wisdom thing. Do you know who did that? Uh Maybe one of our listeners can tell us who did that, but uh, or we can I Google know it. I guess. Use it yep. But I saw it with Stamper. He had like a ladder in one of his works, and uh, then there's knowledge management. Early stuff like Dorothy Leidner. Now that's again yeah, post two thousand did that review. Yep. But uh, 
But I think, and, and then of course, there's the the tacit knowledge versus explicit knowledge, right? That we need to, and I think in in this day of machine learning, it's really interesting. Uh, this idea of what does machine learning do? It's really good at at pattern recognition and pattern matching. And really, when you think about it, at least part of our tacit uh, abilities are that, right? So, so the argument is that some of these machine learning things can can capture tacit knowledge of people that they can't make explicit if you're observing those people or something and matching. Can, I, can I make a side remark here as we go through our list and looking at the ones that um, that we've mentioned so far? And I think there's a very clear pattern here. All of these theories had really a lot of connection to phenomena that were relevant at that time, and you would talking about several of them having connections to phenomena that are relevant today. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's, you know, we haven't talked about some of very grand abstract theory. Apparently, even in our field, you know, media richness, well, we had new you know, communication media coming in. Cognitive load, well, that was when started people started doing problem solving with, you know, digital data, you know, spreadsheets and tables and charts and mm -hmm. stuff like this, right? Diffusion of innovation is kind of obvious, right? They're all always steeped in some very clear empirical phenomena that were happening at the time. And you're making the connections to phenomena that are happening now, like AI and explainability and all these sorts of things. We have not yet talked about any theoretical perspective that we think was really influential that is either very, very low level or very, very high level. All of these are mid-range theories. They explain some stuff yeah. and some other yeah. stuff they don't. Don't you think? All right. So so I'm looking at Wikipedia. Data, information, knowledge, wisdom uh, has a lot of different fathers, uh, in a sense. And I say fathers because they all seem to be men. But uh, Kenneth Boulding had a version, The Economist, in 1955, I guess. And then there are a bunch of people that were data folks. Uh, there's a Chinese guy. Uh, Yifu Tuan, uh, sociologist Daniel Bell. I think I've seen it with Daniel Bell. Daniel Bell is the one I think I've seen attributed data information. Uh, an Irish guy, Mike Cooley. So apparently, a lot of people around the 80s, early 80s, uh, were Russell Ackoff had one in 1989, but by then, Big there are already guy, a bunch yeah. of people. Yeah. So anyway, apparently, there are a lot of uh, originations for, uh, and then there's, of course, Tuomi. Has it backwards? I don't know if you've ever seen that, but Tuomi has a paper where, so the hierarchy is on the lowest end, you have data, then process data is information, then whatever information and practice is knowledge, and then whatever becomes wisdom. So what Tuomi had is on the bottom, wisdom. And in order, you have to have wisdom to have knowledge, knowledge to have information, information. Uh, right. So, so he put it upside down. I don't remember, but it was a clever little spin on that. But I think there's the knowledge-based view of the firm which has its roots, uh, that, that would be Grant and, and Kogut and Xander and and our knowledge management stuff. Amrit Tawana did some cool things. And, and I'll tell you what, I think this idea of knowledge right now in this data analytics world is, uh, is something that I don't see people talking about. And especially with like these LLMs that are everyone's talking about right now, right? What are we really talking about? We're talking about knowledge. So That's interesting, I mean, some of my right? own research, my next frontier is going to be knowledge capture, knowledge sharing. Right, really, because uh, knowledge management was dead. It was really yeah. dead because it was really hot in the early 2000s. And then people kind of figure, well, we can't really build a good knowledge management system. It doesn't really work. And then people got, you know, got less interested in it. And but you, you're right. I see it how it would have an application now. Because the big question with LLMs is, how do we know <laughs> that yeah. whatever this thing is giving me is, you know, is true? It actually contains knowledge and not just bullshit. That's yeah. one of the big questions at the moment. Yeah. And if you look at where knowledge now, I am not a knowledge management researcher, but or I haven't been. But if you look at where it ended in practice, it was wikis. Yeah. <laughs> How are we going to manage knowledge with listservs and wikis? And 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 the big the the <laughs> fundamental knowledge management problem was always people will use it, but they won't generate it. How do you capture your knowledge? Yeah, in such a way that other people can use it. Uh, we yeah. need to incentivize. How do you make you tacit know? knowledge explicit? It's still the question. How do you capture that and then share it? Not yeah. only tacit knowledge explicit, but how do you make explicit knowledge explicit? Right? How do you get people to put it down uh, so that others can use it? And uh, well, then that's the ask problem. Ask me a question. Have you ever have you ever actually written anything on Wikipedia or edited one of them? Yes. Oh, you have? Because I've never done yeah. that. Yeah, see, I've only done I, one. And again, it was for Kale. I made a page for him. I think you that's made a page the only for Kale. Can you make a page for me? <laughs> yeah, I'll make a page for you. I'll oh, do that no, right now. <laughs> All right. Not right, right. now. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes right before our next podcast, I'm going to make a Wikipedia page for you. Oh, please don't. So can we, um, 
Do you have a, a, a some more entries on your? I have two more. Do you have some more on your on your Go list ahead. of no. big five? All right. So I'll I'll give you another classic, um, which is this entire stream around the resource based view of the firm. You know, Jay Barney's work, and then uh, its application into into our field, and then even you know Tease's uh, adaptation to a you know the extension with dynamic capabilities. That yeah. big that stream is from sort of from the from the early '90s, and it's relevant and big and powerful to this day. Sure. Yeah. And it's basically anything around capabilities, competencies, dynamic capabilities, not only yeah. TEAS, but Eisenhart and Martin. I always like that one better. They kind of made TEAS more useful, I thought. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of TEAS per, per se, but I do like the original stuff also because I think it's really well formulated theory. It has very clear attributes. It says, look, it's about imitability. It's about rarity, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, if you have these attributes, these resources, good. And then what you need to do is these other three, four things. So it's a very clearly defined theories that you can, you know, it's what I would call fertile. You take the theory and you can quite readily derive a hypothesis and go and test it. Well, all right. So I'm just going to get, I didn't have this prepared, but it made me realize that the other competing kind of theory of the firm is transaction cost economics. Yeah. And I would say that that's Williamson, but I would say for our field, and there's a paper that I don't know if people know about it. It's Malone, 1987, right? Where he talked about electronic cool. impact on theory of the firm. And I think that it's Malone and a couple other people, uh, Malone at all. But uh, so anyway, I just thought that that's just your RBV idea made me think about the other one. And I think that that paper is worth reading for anybody interested in firm level economics and the impact of digital technologies. And actually, I think if we went and looked at it with this idea of AI and firms and AI and platforms, I bet you there's a, a paper in there somewhere just applying those ideas. Because he was talking about how electronic communications uh, reduce transactions costs, right? So yeah, they do. And what what I like at the moment about the resource based view of the firm is, especially in the startup space and the entrepreneurship space, because people go back to this and they they try to figure out what is it with digital startups that make them grow and scale uh, so differently, right? Because this entire the, the classic view, the Penrose view, doesn't really hold anymore. Because now we have you know we have startups they make uh, their balance sheet is like minus minus fifty million, but they got mm -hmm. four hundred million users. You know, like they scale very differently. And there's a couple of really nice papers. One with uh, Huang and, and Ola. Um, there's some people in strategy like Toby Kretschmer and others. They they look at this, and a lot of them are basically applications and refinements of RBV in a mm -hmm. context where the resource itself isn't actually rare isn't actually inimitable anymore, right? So some of the digital resources are quite qualitatively differently. And so some of that stuff isn't quite working out the same way. Yeah. Um, so I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. All right. So what's your last one? Oh, come on. You got to give me one in between. I can't, it can't just be my list. Here. Oh, well, I have to make one up then. I mean, so the one that I had written down here, and I'll, I'll just mention it again, because it flowed. I had it flowing from sociotechnical. But I think that... Uh, uh, I'll say institutional theory, right? And this is because this is what I do and, and whatever, but it, it kind of flows from the same Barley 1986 and, and Orlikowski and structurational. My, but then what you'll find is that uh, uh, what happened is since the 1990s to now is institutional theory became like the big lens for uh, social theory and organizations, right? If you go read pages of organization science and, and whatever, and you're looking at anything in social theory, it's going to be, I guess there's the critical realist branch, but uh, it's all institutional theory. It's institutional logics, yep. institutional entrepreneurship, institutional this, institutional that. And, and you could trace it in part to diffusion of innovation, but I think it just goes back to Giddens, Bourdieu, right? Uh, Berger and Luckman, you know, a lot of what we talk. So, so I think that if you're interested in kind of a social theoretic side, you want to, you know, we talked about this in on the podcast so in the past, right? One My, question there that I have is like, to me as an outsider, you know, this, I haven't been really been familiar with this. I heard about it, et cetera. I've, I've gone into reading it over the last two to three years since we started doing this, but uh, my impression was it was always big, but you're saying it, it, it got big over the last 10 years well, or so? So no, it was it was always big in sociology, okay. <laughs> right? Uh, but if you look at organizational research, it was, you know, whatever. It was very economic. It was sociology was there, sort of. Economics was there. There were these, but then what happened? If uh, but there were other competing perspectives on organizations, uh, and then I think what happened is around. 
uh, probably late 90s, early 2000s, it just took over. You know, read AMJ. If it's an organizational level, you know, social theoretic thing, it's going to be institutional theory. Read right. organization science, any of these. It's just taken over. Uh, perfect example is like uh, Raghu Garud, right? He's, by the way, if if you, you don't know the work of Raghu Garud, he's not an IS researcher. He's an organizational researcher for any of our listeners. Just read literally anything the guy wrote. It's always cool. Uh <laughs> <laughs> but he was he was studying you know uh, innovation. He was looking at uh, path dependency, path creation with Carnot. He was looking at modularity, and then what did he do? Institutional entrepreneurship. You can almost trace it to his career, uh, you know. And then he ushered in that that new era of institutionalism in organizations, right? So. That's true. That's true. All right, I'll give you one which is similar to yours in the sense is this is stuff that I work with, the same as you, right? So my because my number one on this list from theories from the 90s in IS is uh Yair's and Ron's representation theory. Yeah, um, that's where I, I was wondering I, if you'd bring that up. Yeah, I, I bring that up. It's it it it's literally what got me into this field, and I still think first of all, I still think it's super applicable to this day. It's it's kind of a mind a way of of thinking about the world and everything in it. And I think you can you can use this language that they introduce and really think about anything from, from chatbots to process mining to analytics, all of that you can think of in the sort of concepts and terms that they introduce. It's also the one theory that really try to get into what the hell is an information system, you know? And how mm. do we know that this information system here is better than this one here? How do we theorize about this? Right, and it's yeah. also a fascinating case study in in theory diffusion and adoption and sort of you know the social aspects of it all. I think to be honest, because it's got huh. somehow it's got a bad rap. People think it's an ontological claim. I don't think that's yeah. true at all. Absolutely not. Um, you know, anyway. So, um, but I I do think this is a great great example of a very interesting theoretical development from the late eighties, where people try to grapple with what is this thing that that our field is concerned about. You know, they, and uh, and and we can. I I I find myself thinking about whatever is happening now in terms of the concepts and the the attributes and the properties that this theory and the language is giving me. But is it is it a semiotic theory at its root, like, uh, or or what what where does representation theory come from? Well, well, you, it comes from they they took a formal ontological model of the world by by Mario Bunge. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the reason for choosing that particular model it has is some very pragmatic reasons behind it. Number one, it was very well formalized and could be really well adapted. It was just applicable. I think that's the basic thing. They they wanted to think about what is an information system, how can we describe it, and they found this model in the in the in the philosophical works of Mario Bunge, and they found it. Oh yeah, I can take that and you know transfer it here, and it becomes applicable. And then it, it's also I think it's a very generative theory. It makes a lot of claims. And saying like, you know, it should be this way and should be that way and it shouldn't be redundant and it shouldn't be overloaded and excess is bad and, you know, whatever. Um, and and these are really, you can very nicely derive hypotheses. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. for example, I mean, in a recent thing, like in, in the in the pandemic, I used that theory, one of the very lesser known parts, to think about whether or not these Corona dashboards, you know, the WHO mm -hmm. dashboard and the... University of Chicago, you know, whether they're any good, <laughs> whether these are good information systems and figured, well, mm -hmm. they could be made better. And, you know, you had some ideas on how to make it better. Um, so anyway, so does so it I, assume I, symbol processing, like uh, an information system is like a symbol processing system? Like, yeah. why, do you, why, do you, why do they use the word representation? I, I, to be honest, I think the word representation is just the name we give it to it now. It used to be called differently. The representation model is one of three theoretical models they came up with. They came up with three models, the representation model, the state tracking model, and the good decomposition model. And they all serve very different uh, sort of dependent variables, if you think, right? Um, and the hmm. basic idea is an information system is effective if it's, if it's a more cost-effective way of reasoning about the world than observing the real world behavior directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you follow every invoice throughout an organization to its supply chain partners, or if you have an SAP system that has the invoices and you can track them, that information mm -hmm. system is a is a much more cost effective way of processing the information and reasoning about the state of the invoices and whether they have been paid and following them directly. That's that's the basic idea behind it, right? And then so you it's... can ask about what is an information system? How does it have to be designed? What does it have to do to to be more effective than the alternatives? Mm hmm. Yeah. And so for so example, I, I should read your paper. You wrote that paper with ABJ. 
We wrote we wrote a thirty year review. After thirty, we said like, look, it's been thirty years. What has been done? What do we know? What do we not know? You know, what's the verdict here? We basically wanted to find out. All right, should we put this to rest or not? And of course, the answer is it depends. Of yeah, so I looked at that, and I have to say, you know, I've uh, this is not my area, and it's not something I've studied or, or paid too much attention to. But my uh, external, completely ignorant view of like your paper and representation theory in general was always like a, and maybe I'm one of those people that you said dismissed it as a as a view of the world, but it's like an ontology, right? It's like a, a way to think about things. That's like fine. <laughs> so that's a way to think about things. So is any other number of ways, and then it's all good, right? Uh, yeah, there's some uh, truth to that. I think it's a way. Yeah. Like I find myself finding that that that's the way that I look at the world. And many things. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's a thing. The thing has properties, and as a relationship, and the relationship is emergent properties. You know, that's sort of yeah. That's how I look at the world. But it's a kind yeah. of useful way for for academic purposes to to look at the world. Yeah. All right. Cool. So good. Representation theory. We should read your 2017 paper. And yeah, I don't have any more. That's all the foundational theories that I have, Wrecker. Are you? Well, we got to continue this. List? We got it. Right. Yeah, we, we did actually. I, I do have oh. other things here, but we'll talk about them next time. You know, oh, we, we got to do the same thing. Yeah, go for it. Post 2000, like yeah, recently, exactly 2000. like what are the things right now that if I were a PhD student, yeah. I would be like, okay, this is going to be cool next 15 years, right? Okay, that's going to be tough. All right, I'll do some yeah. homework. It'll be the same things I just mentioned. <laughs> All right. All right. And then we do a, a third one, and that's just be the, the, the five big ideas that were forgotten but shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> maybe they should be forgotten. Uh, maybe. So we'll maybe forget them. Good. All right, dude. It was good talking to you, as usual. See you next time. Definitely. See you.